Hello, and welcome to this week's Billing and Reimbursement Webinar Live Chat. Okay, so we're going to, excuse me, we're going to talk about accuracy, which is, of course, the number one job in our profession. And when I say our profession, I actually expand that to every single person who is working in healthcare in any particular way of working in healthcare. Um, I don't care if you're the receptionist at the front desk of the hospital uh, or a billing and coding uh, professional. The fact is that everything we do must be done with purpose and accuracy. And now we're talking about money. And some people think, well, it's a physician's office, physicians are rich, or it's a big hospital. Every little nickel and dime doesn't count. But first of all, it does count. Second of all, if you don't do your job properly, a lot of places will just push it off on the patients. And then the patients are paying unfairly. So this week, we're going to talk about the algorithms, the formulas used to determine how much is being reimbursed from the third party payer. And I want you to think of this in the same way you might if you were or if you are being paid on an hourly basis, for example, um, if you are being paid on an hourly basis, for example, the algorithm is very simple, okay? You're gonna get paid $20 per hour of every hour you work. You work this many hours, we multiply this by this, and that's your paycheck. And that is very important. Now, from your side, you want it to be accurate because that's the proper thing, right? I work 10 hours. You pay me $20 an hour. That's going to be $200. Give me not $190 because you earn $200. On the other side of that, not $205 because then you're taking money you didn't earn. And that you already know is illegal and fraud, okay? So I want you to become familiar with the processes of what can happen in your professional responsibility as a coding professional, as a billing and reimbursement professional. Many places it's all tied together. Okay, so let's first take a look at the most common errors that happen on medical claim forms. Okay, now this might be human error. It might be, oops, my finger hit the wrong key, or it might be illegal intent. And I'm going to explain to you how the third party payers determine which that is. And the way they do that is, here we are in 2023, all healthcare claims, with the exception of a minor few that have to get permission first, are electronically submitted. So that means they're going from your computer at work to the computer at the third party payer, whether it's Medicare or Aetna or Prudential or whatever, okay? The first thing is their computers are programmed to look for accuracy, okay? Now, when they find a mistake, two things are going to happen. Uh, number one, the claim will get rejected or denied. And number two, there will be a tag. So your organization will be flagged 
and the computer is going to take a special extra look at every one of the claims filed by your organization facility, whether it's a one physician doctor's office, a clinic, a hospital, whatever. The computers are going to oh, look extra special at these. Okay. Now, if the error happened once or twice over the course of a year, then that's okay. We chuck that up to human error. Okay. We're all human. See, see. Okay. So uh, nothing will happen. Okay. Other than you having to deal with those rejected or denied claims. However, if the computers detect a pattern and you make the same exact error 20 times in a year, now that is suspicious. Now, yes, it could be hiring of unqualified people, or it could be malevolous evil. Whatever it is, they're going to look. They're going to look closer. They're going to look deeper. They're going to keep looking and investigate. So the first thing is upcoding, which means that a higher level of code was reported for a diagnosis or a procedure than what was actually fact. Okay, so a, uh, a simple fracture of the ulna is coded as a compound fracture of the ulna. Well, how does that get you more money? Well, if, if we're going to talk about DRGs, but if the facility is being paid using the DRG algorithms, then that's going to increase the, the, the funds, okay? If it's a procedure and you say, instead of a simple repair of a laceration, it's reported as a complex repair of a laceration, that's going to directly influence the amount of the procedure because that procedure requires more work. So you get paid more. But if it's not true, uh-oh. All right. Now, undercoding is problematic more so for the facility itself than for the third-party payer, okay? Because this is the equivalent of you're paying me $20 an hour. I work 10 hours, but I'm only going to report eight hours that I worked. So you don't have to pay me the whole amount. <laughs> That's kind of silly, isn't it? I don't, I don't know who that benefits, okay? And you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, of course it doesn't make any sense. Asking for more money than you actually legitimately deserve doesn't make any sense. However, and this will happen more so in physicians' offices and clinics rather than hospitals, but nothing is 100% in this world, is so what will happen is the coders or whoever's doing the coding may not be trained properly, or the physician is doing the coding, which means they're definitely not trained properly, um, and they're afraid. They're afraid of, well, I don't know what the criteria is to report this, so I'll just undercode it because then I won't get in trouble with with the government or with the third party payer. Um, well, that is true. However, we're not a fan of actually paying less for the work you did. Now, sometimes it's because the physician's documentation is not complete. And the coder does not query the physician and say, hey, I need to know these details so I can code this completely. And there are, I've had students who have worked in doctor's offices where their supervisor or the um, practice manager will say, we don't talk to the doctors. No, 
you just code the best you can with what you got, which of course is not correct way to do things. And so then if you don't have the details to support a higher level of code, you have no choice. But again, this is the equivalent of you work 10 hours, you earn $200, but you're only asking for $160. That That's no way to run an airline, as they used to say. Okay, so the fact is, is that medical coding professionals, your job is to always obtain what is known as optimal reimbursement, which means the most you're allowed that was earned, the $200, not more, but certainly not less either. So as long as you have the documentation or you query to get the documentation, you can code accurately. Okay, unbundling, and you may have heard this concept before, but as you are learning coding, particularly, you will see that there are codes that are combination codes. In other words, they report more than one thing at a time, and that is because more these more than one thing at a time things are very, very often provided together. So instead of you having to code three codes, we are going to just give you one code, just make everybody's life easier. Okay. And my favorite example of this is um, the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella. Okay. And they now actually have one vaccine that is the combination, measles, mumps, rubella, all in one vial, all in one injection. That's a good thing for your kids, usually the kids, okay? So if that was what was used for this patient, there are, and I have heard this, okay? There are people who rationalize and say, well, if I put three codes, one for the measles vaccine, one for the rubella vaccine, and one for the mumps vaccine, I'm not lying, But you are lying because then there's this code that says measles, mumps, rubella all in one. Okay. So no unbundling. If you have a combination code, you are required to use it. Okay. Okay. All right. At this time of year, and here we are in February, and, um, you know, it, I, <sighs> Gosh, I have heard doctors' offices, particularly again, who have who have done this as they say, oh, well, you know, the new coding manuals are expensive. So just use last year's. Okay. What are the chances are there's a new code or a deleted code in this section of the book? Okay. Well, hmm. that's like playing Russian roulette with your with your paycheck. I don't know. There was a memo that came out that instead of $20 an hour, I was given a raise for two more dollars an hour, but I have to apply for it. I just have to put in market on my time card, whatever. Okay. And you don't bother to read the memos. Um, so you don't get the $2 an hour raise. Okay. And worse than that is then if the co if the claim is rejected because of this, a lot of places will make the patient pay for it. Okay. And failing to check NCCI edits. Well, what are those? I'm gonna tell you. Okay, come on. Come on with me to the next slide and I'm gonna tell you. NCCI, National Correct Coding Initiative. Doesn't that make sense? Who else would want and care about you coding correctly than the people who are giving you money? Okay, yeah, I totally agree with that. All right. Well, it doesn't cover everything, but there are two specific types within or formats or measures within the National Co Correct Coding Initiative, the NCCI. 
And those, those are known as PTP edits, procedure to procedure, and medically unlikely edits, MUE. Now, I just want to warn you, they did not invite me to the meeting when they determined the name for this. So you're just going to have to bear with me and learn and understand, okay, because I don't think that second one is a really good name. But all right, let's talk about PTP, procedure to procedure. This identify out of all the procedures in the whole entire world that are in your CPT book, this program identifies two procedures that cannot or should not be provided to the same patient on the same date of service. Okay. So that makes sense, right? So I'm going to give you a whack out. I know we have examples on the screen, but I'll give you a whack out that hopefully will make you laugh and also bring the concept home better, which is this is like reporting, giving a patient a pedicure. All right, maybe that's due to whacked out. Okay, so fixing, casting a broken foot, a broken left foot, on a patient during the same date of service, the same patient, that you also report a below the knee amputation of the left leg. That's much better than that application thing. Okay, right? So you're going to report setting a fracture in a foot that you end up dis disarticulating from the body. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Nope, nope, nope. So this is this is what procedure to procedure is. These are procedures that cannot or should not be provided to the same patient on the same date of service. Okay. All right. So you can carry that picture with you of this patient whose left leg is now in... Um, uh, the morgue or wherever they put amputated pieces and is a beautiful cast on the foot. Well, it's there. Okay. All right. It's just not logical. And this is one of the reasons why we made you take anatomy and physiology it, before you started coding is because you have to be able to look at these procedures and get an understanding and you also have Google, by the way, but to get an understanding of what was going on with the patient so that you can go back and query the physician and say, this is going to get us in trouble because this is, this is not going to work. Okay. A pedicure on an amputated leg. All right. That's funnier, easier to remember, right? Okay. So now the other one, the medically unlikely edits, MUE. And now you'll see why exactly why I don't like this title is because it has to do with an incorrect unit of service. You know, so you have a procedure and you say, well, we did this twice. Okay, except that you can't do that twice on a patient on the same date of service. So this actually is a good example of myelography. The, the description of the myelography is two or more regions. Now the documentation said they did myelography on three regions. So you're gonna report this code three times? No, because it says two or more regions. Three is more than two. Come on, you all learned that in first grade, right? Okay, maybe sooner. Three is more than two. So that means this one code reported once covers all of the things, okay? So again, another reason why you must read the full code with descriptions, comparing that to the physician documentation. We do a lot. And what does it all have to do with? It all has to do, excuse me, with reporting accuracy. 
You just tell the truth about what actually happened. OK, so now you can see why medically unlikely edits. I don't like that. It should have a name that is more to do with incorrect units of service. So instead of M-U-E, it might be I-U-S, which they didn't invite me to the meeting. I told you that. So you're just going to have to remember medically unlikely edits, which just means the numbers don't match. OK. All right, let's look at something else now. RBRVS, resource-based relative value system. RBRVS is an algorithm, a formula that has been intensely worked on to determine how much each procedure as identified by a CPT code is valued to be reimbursed, okay? So whoever it was sat down and they looked at what exactly does the physician have to do? How hard does the physician have to work? How long does it take? How many resources? What knowledge? The whole of how much does this physician have to work? OK, and the easiest way for you to imagine this or understand this is to say, well, obviously. um putting two stitches in a short little laceration does not take the same amount of physician work as open heart surgery. Physician has to work much harder in open heart surgery, right? Okay, all right. So they look at that with regard to what this procedure code is reporting. In addition, they look at practice expenses so we're talking primarily about outpatient RBRVS um, practice expenses. So this is going to contribute an amount of money into this reimbursement that's going to pay the rent on the building, um, the electricity bill, um, the equipment, all of that stuff, okay? And then malpractice expenses, which also is a measure of the riskiness, how intense and how risky this is. And because physicians are required to carry malpractice insurance, therefore, the RBRVS takes that into account and contributes to that as well. Okay. So each of these three components are measured by relative value units. So our two stitches for this tiny laceration may be one unit, whereas open heart surgery may be 32 units, whatever, okay? And like that. And then once a year, the United States Congress meets and they determine a dollar value for each of the units. So if a unit was worth $10, then we have our little one, one RBRVU for our two stitch little laceration versus 32 multiplied by that dollar amount. And that's, that's how we get to how much the CPT code is going to be reimbursed. And there's one more thing that's involved in this, and that is a geographic um, adapter, if you will. I, I don't think that's the right word, but there is a measure in there that is multiplied by the number of relative value units to alter for geography. And this is because um, the, the rent, for example, for the facility, the lease, on the property uh, is going to be much higher in Manhattan, New York, New York City, versus Omaha, Nebraska, which has a lower cost of living, or Butte, Montana. So this RBRVS, we have each CPT code is formulated to be X number of relative value units, then that is multiplied by the geographic indicator, 
which is going to raise or or not change, alter the amount of money based on the physical location, the geographic location of the facility where these services were provided. And then, and then that gives us the number of units. And then all of that is multiplied by the dollar value for that year as determined by Congress, the United States Congress, usually somewhere around November of each year. Well, that's complicated. I know, but the good news is you don't have to do the math. You just need to understand what's involved in this. Okay? And how a different level of CPT code can dramatically change the reimbursement amount. Okay, one more, one more very complex algorithm for reimbursement. Now, at this point in time, diagnosis related groups, DRGs, are used only by Medicare to reimburse only inpatient services for their beneficiaries. So only Medicare. Only hospitals, not doctor's offices, not clinics, not, okay? All right. Now, DRGs are a type of episodic payment. So basically what they do is they look at the diagnosis codes, and these are the six primary, these are the six primary components that make up the algorithm, the formulation for how much, again, each procedure is worth, or each, it's actually not procedure-based, as you can see, um, it's for each stay in the hospital, okay? So principal diagnosis is basically gonna tell us why this patient was admitted into the hospital, okay? Secondary diagnosis, very important, because let's say the patient was admitted to the hospital with a compound fracture of the tibia, lower leg, okay? All right, so we're going to do some surgery, realign the bone, and maybe keep the, the patient in the hospital for a day or two to watch them, okay? So now we have two patients with the exact same complex tibial fracture. Okay, they both had the exact same surgery, but one of these patients is otherwise healthy. The other patient has type 2 diabetes mellitus, secondary diagnosis. Well, caring for the patient with the fracture who has diabetes myelitis is going to be much more complex because patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus have a problem in healing. They also, of course, have to get medication, more medication than a healthy patient. And um, there are also other things that have to, that can come into play, such as neuropathy, which is common with patients with type 2 diabetes, which is going to um, peripheral neuropathy, which has to do with the arms and the legs. So we have that issue again, affecting a tibial fracture. It becomes more complex to care for this patient. Therefore, they're going to get paid more. Okay. Age, gender, sex, not sex. I don't know why we can't get people to use the correct term. We are talking about gender here, not sex. We're not having sex in the hospital room. This is sex as in to gender. Is this a male or female? Okay. And then discharge status. It's really complex. And they're going, They, for the most part, hospitals use and third-party payers use or Medicare uses a software program that is going to calculate what the DRG is. But again, something you need to understand, something you need to understand because the principal diagnosis, the secondary diagnosis have a major impact on how much the hospital is gonna be reimbursed. And if you put the wrong one first and second, then that messes everything up. Okay. 
So you are guys are doing all the right things. Okay. You guys are doing the right things because you're here in school and you're learning how to do this job accurately. So that's, that's a good thing. Okay, not like people who say, oh, I could do that, but they don't really know what they're doing. You don't want to do that. It's too important. Okay, so as you are learning, please, please, please email me, safianSC at cctech.edu. The email address under class list in the course is not accurate. It will send your email to one of the rings of Saturn, and I will never see it, okay? SC at cctech.edu. I will get it. I will reply within 24 hours. I will answer your questions. If you want to set up an appointment to talk on the phone, we can do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom. We can do FaceTime, whatever is most convenient for you, because I'm here to help you learn accurately, okay? Have a great week. See you next time.